Okay. Um, as Jean mentioned, I am with the Tarflower uh, chapter of the Native Plant Society, and I'm having the same problems you are, <laughs> you had. Um, very sensitive, I'm changing the slides. I've with, been with the Native Plant Society for over 20 years, and my um, I'm fourth generation Floridian. Uh, great grandparents came over, but I did not live most of my life, adult life, in Florida. Came back after retire um, to work with the Navy, and my aha moment on native plants was I bought one small elephant's foot plant at a plant sale, brought it home, stuck it in my subdivision garden. And I swear every pollinator known to man was on that tiny one inch flower because the place was a dead zone for any of our pollinators with all of the exotics and non blooming um, plants in there. So uh, that convinced me, hey, there's something to this. So I'm gonna run you through real quick on uh, the incredible diversity of Florida and you have to know, we have over, depending on how you want to count it, about 90 ecosystems in Florida. Any other state in the United States may have three or four, except maybe California. Um, so if you don't believe me, take a mental trip in your head between Tallahassee and Key West, and you can see and go from coast to coast how incredibly diverse this peninsula is. So just to give you some statistics, that's how many vascular plants, that's how many ferns, and this says 50 natural, but those are mostly the land, not counting uh, coastal and um, water uh, ecosystems like coral reefs, etc. So you can see we are very diverse here. We have 700 vertebrates, invertebrates, unbelievable, and three endemic mammals, one of them being the Florida mouse. Meaning endemic, they don't appear anywhere else in the world except right here. And not too far from you, one of our endemic mice, very rare and endangered, is the Anastasia um, Park, uh, Field, uh, field mouse, dune mouse, that's there on Anastasia Island. It, he's quite different from the others and appears nowhere else. So just looking at that, you know we are totally different. We have all kinds of water, um, wetlands. The top left is, no, that's not me, I'm taking the photo, but that's the Fakahatchee Strand down south. And then our various lakes, coastal dunes, and rivers. Uh, tons of rivers. We have streams, lakes, and springs. And if anybody hasn't gone to Itchitutney Springs Park and tube down the Itchitutney, go do it now. <laughs> Hurry before it gets ruined. Um, we also have some very unique um, landscapes, one called Scrub which would be, there's coastal scrub, but the most well-known scrub is the Lake Wales Ridge. The ridge was the only island in ancient times above water when Florida was underwater. So there, all of the plants and animals on, the, on these ridges are unique and right now in highly endangered. Um, the bottom left is the scrub morning glory a uh, tiny little vine with a great big flower. And the pure white sand, you know you're in scrub, not a beach, but if you're out there with the trees on the inland and you come across that white, white sand, you know you're in scrub. Sand Hill was created as the waters receded, um, drawn up into the two uh, polar caps and Sand Hill was what was left. So I jokingly, when we're working with children, um, tell them, you know, Florida was underwater. So fishes eat coral and poop out sand. So you're walking on fish poop. 
It's not quite true, but it gets the children's attention. Uh, again, the Sand Hill communities are high, dry, and sandy, mostly converted to citrus um, in days gone by. And this is what uh, Jean was talking about, what the restoration we are doing at Oakland Nature Preserve. Now, this is a picture of Wakaiba, who is the poster child for this uh, ecosystem. Um, all of us strive to look like that. We may never get there because it's degraded by agriculture. What we're trying to, you can't recreate what took nature millions of years to do, but we're getting close. Uh, pine flatwoods, uh, the, the wetter as we get down off of the sand hill and scrub and cop, head towards more wet areas, you'll run into pine flatwoods. Again, a drop dead gorgeous landscape Native plants, you know, this is sort of tooting our own horn in terms of why do we like natives? But they evolved here and they've adapted to our environment. I mean, where else in the world can you take flooding rains, fires, and then drought and a little bit of cold sometimes and still persist? So they have figured it out. Invasive species, I won't, that's another whole lecture, um, but we need to control them. And the exotics do not provide habitat or food because they did not involve with our, evolve with our wildlife. On the other hand, I think um, nature adapts and a lot of our invasives are now being spread by birds eating the fruit. And I can think specifically of balsa apple or um, what's that other uh, Brazilian pepper. So we, we are on an uphill battle. And there's Brazilian pepper, the Me Mexican petunia. I'll go more into that a little bit later. And if you look at some of these photos of like old world climbing fern, um, it, it's it's just amazing how fast and how utterly destructive some of these introduced plants can be. Uh, Chinese tallow, toxic to livestock. Hey, my grandmother had a Chinese tallow and so did my mother. I thought it was a gorgeous tree. Growing up, little did we know back then. Um, Lantana. Yeah, we'll fight with the butterfly enthusiasts to try and get that out of our yards. It's a butterfly magnet, but we do have a native and it is just as pleasing to the butterflies. Why should we care about all of this diversity in Florida? Well, we get new medicines. For instance, the palmetto berries have been found to be to help with prostate cancer, you guys. Um, and poachers are going into our natural areas and just stripping all the berries off of um, the palmetto. And that's a major food source for a lot of our mammals through the winter. Um, no justification for wanton destruction, especially now. But more, uh, I like is um, they, it sustains our food chain. What is it? One third, two thirds of the food you put in your mouth was pollinated um, by a bee and killing them off. I'm sure Jean can tell you more about that than I can. So why plant natives? Increase the urban biodiversity. Our backyards, if you ever get a chance or if you haven't already, listen to a lecture by Doug Tallamy on um, any of his books or any of his stuff, our backyards are becoming the refuge uh, for our wildlife and for our plants. If you take a look of Florida and for instance, the uh, migratory flyway for birds, you will see birds coming down the East Coast trying to get to the Caribbean, South America. They basically follow I-4. And what's on I-4? Concrete. Um, and, you know, it's like, where are these birds going to stop and eat? Your backyards. 
will be the last refuge. And I like um, preserving a sense of place. We don't want to look like Kansas, no matter what Disney says. Um, but it, it's just, hey, look at this gorgeous plant nobody else has seen. I can't tell you the number of people in my subdivision where I'm about the only one to have anything native in the yard. Children stop and amaze at the flowers. And I always get comments. And I love it when we get cold weather and I can watch all those tropical exotics just melt. And my little natives are there flourishing. So there you go. But the actual uh, meat of this presentation is our Florida Friendly Landscaping Ordinances. Um, so we're going to talk more about how to conserve water and what is drought tolerant, deed restrictions, et cetera. Um, so we'll get right into it. So here's your nine principles. Put the right plant in the right place. Duh, that doesn't take much, it <laughs> just takes common sense. You don't see a cactus in the middle of a swamp. So uh, why we insist on planting some of these exotics that just don't wanna live here. Um, Water, fertilize, mulch. I'm glad you brought up the pine straw. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, how to manage the pests. And some of these we're already doing. I won't dwell on it too much. Recycle, storm water, and protecting our waterways. But attracting wildlife, remember, get that picture in your mind of I-4 and that poor bird trying to find food. So right plant, right place attracting wildlife. This is a retention pond um, downtown Orlando where they have um, put native plants in along the edge of the pond. So many times our ponds are just grass right down and then we have to hire a company to come in and do lake management and get rid of the algae and stuff. Whereas if we just put the right plants along the edge, it'll clean the water before it gets into the pond. And it attracts wildlife, as in birds nesting, etc. And here's where you need to know what the uh, requirements of the plant is for its water. In other words, don't plant a canna lily next to a cactus. You're going to kill both either by overwatering or not watering enough. So group the plants and let grasses go dormant during the drier weather and install a um, rain barrel. We used to give classes on how to construct a rain barrel and do all the painting designs around it and stuff. And it's really cool. My rain barrel's right outside my office window and when it rains, I watch it fill up and it's just underneath one of the valleys on the roof. And it just has mosquito netting over the top and it's very easy to maintain. But watering efficiently is very important. And your natives, if you put the right plant in the right place, won't need that much water once it's established and happy where it is. Uh, fertilize. Personally, if it's native, it doesn't need any fertilizer. Um, and all of those numbers should be zero across the top. And there's ordinances out there and uh, this slide needs updating to more recent uh, as to what you should use. Only those exotics need the fertilizer. You buy a native plant, it's got good dirt in the pot from a good nursery. You just stick it in the sand, guys, or stick it in the muck, depending on what uh, type of plant, wet or dry, that you've purchased. And please, no more than 10 feet from water, any water body, if you are going to fertilize that St. Augustine, um, runoff, and especially, I, I love seeing companies coming out and uh, putting the 
pesticides and fertilizers down on the lawn during a heavy rainstorm. Where do they think that stuff is going to go? It's going to get washed right down to the drain. Most of our drains either go into a retention pond or into a sewer and out to the lakes and out to the ocean. So what do you think you're, you're not accomplishing anything? Uh, avoid weed and feed products. They really don't work and they kill beneficial bugs. And I don't know about iron instead of nitrogen. Personally, um, I know this is what um, the extension uh, services say, but you don't need anything if you buy the right plant in the right place. And here we go. Um, most of the time, and any of your hortica, or you'll see it in your subdivisions, and any of the mow and blow or any landscaping architects, they want to put down pine bark for your mulch. Pine bark is extremely destructive. After a good rainy season, lift that mulch up and it's all white powdery mildew underneath. It is, uh, it's got diseases. And God forbid you put that mulch up against the trunk of a tree or one of our um, bushes, you will be killing that tree. And the pine bark does not allow the water to percolate down. So it's just going to run off. So pine straw, I was so happy to hear you're buying pine straw. So maybe I'm preaching to the choir here, but your pine straw does the same thing as that pine bark. And God forbid, never buy that col colored mulch. Uh, it's got chemicals in it that are just horrible. Um, the pine straw allows the water to percolate, does not create any bacterial or fungal um, situations. Plus, if you've had any information on our Florida bees, they are ground dwellers. They do not build hives. We have to leave open spaces or have some pine mulch to where it doesn't totally obscure the ground for our bees to go um, in their little burrow with their um, pollen and larva in those little burrows. And by the way, 90% of the Florida native bees and pollinators do not sting. The um, European honeybee does when you get near the hive. And maybe the bumblebee, which is also a social um, bee, but Jean can answer those questions better than me. But the thing here is use pine straw if you have to use mulch. The leaves off of your deciduous trees is perfect mulch for your garden. I watch all my neighbors move from up north, rake up all the leaves, put them in a bag and send them to the landfill. And I'm going, oh my God, you know, and now you're spending money to buy pine bark. Your leaves are perfect. Just think about it. All of our moths, a lot of our moths, caterpillars, and other beneficial insects larval over in a larval form over winter in the mulch, the oak leaf mulch. All of our, our lunar uh, moths and a, a lot of our moths, that's where they're spending their winter in, in their uh, cocoons. And what do we do? We rake it up and throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, where'd the insects go? Well, there's one of the reasons. Use the pine straw if you have to. Attracting wildlife. Yes, this is one of the big things. And by the way, that um, picture right here, hopefully you can see my cursor. That is a thistle known as Cerisium horridulum. You can't get near that, that it won't poke you. But look at all of those swallowtails on one bloom. Unbelievable nectar in this plant. Attracting the wildlife, find a place, have a place in your yard where they can nest, where they can find food and get away from predators. And you don't have to do much in your backyard, just a little bit of native plants and a few trees, and the wildlife will be happy. Ah, one of my favorite slides. 
manage pests responsibly. You go out there and spray or have some of the pesticide guys come in and just start spraying. You're spraying beneficial um, insects. We all know about the ladybug, but did we know about the syrphid fly or any of the, and the lacewing larvae that eats more aphids than the ladybug ever thought about? And all of these, and what really, oops, go back. Um, uh, at most of us here, at least in the older neighborhoods, we all have a um, some kind of citrus tree, orange, lemon, growing in our backyard. And occasionally you go out and most, a lot of the leaves have been eaten. Well, that's the giant swallow, that's the giant swallowtail who likes citrus. And it's like, what's the first thing we do? Spray the tree, oh my God, something's eating my le the leaves of my tree, this is terrible. No find out exactly what it is and how to take care of it. For the most part, a strong stream of high pressure water on a plant will get rid of the aphids and bring in the beneficial insects. If we have a nicely balanced yard, the beneficial insects will be there and um, we shouldn't have a problem. Now, I'm not talking vegetable gardening because those are all exotics to begin with. So God knows what kind of pests are on those. Um, and think about it. We have to have insects. What do you think baby birds eat in the spring? They're not eating nuts and great big crunchy things like their adults. They are eating caterpillars. They are eating little larvae, et cetera. So if you want the baby birds, you need the insects. Recycle, I don't need to preach to the choir on that one. Um, reduce stormwater runoff. These are the swales. Um, and you can see in this, of course, the rain barrel. Um, and then little rain gardens like this, where the water is gonna come downhill, hit this and stay there and come into the swales um, and then percolate down. Guys, we all know Florida's having a drinking water issue. Um, what we're doing is concreting over all of the recharge areas, high, dry, and sandy, uh, like Claremont and up there by the villages. That's where the rainwater percolates down into our aquifer and recharges it again. The water that hits concrete, your driveway, the street, runs to the sewer, runs to the river, and runs out to the ocean or into a lake, and then evaporates. We are not recharging our aquifer sufficiently. And by doing the swales and doing the rain gardens, we're allowing the water to percolate. Protect the waterfront. Um, again, I talked about this earlier where we have grass. This is the retention pond in my subdivision, oops, um, where all of the herbicides and fertilizers are running right into the lake and my HOA spends tons of money to have somebody come in and treat the pond. Uh, and it's like, and I tried, I tried with my HOA in the early days when I had a lot of energy um, to do a uh, littoral planting to clean the water before it goes in. And then I found out that the way the pond was constructed was there was heavy rock and pebble um, from about five, six feet from the water's edge. And I couldn't plant anything if I wanted to. Uh, you couldn't get through the rock. So there it sits and there we pay tons of money. Uh, improving the aesthetics of retention pond and absorbing and intercepting pollutants. And it increases wildlife habitat. All of our migratory birds are down here. They are using those littoral plants in our wetlands, et cetera. And it'll reduce erosion if you plant the right plants there. Ah, now, 
this is an old photo, but it's basically the old Navy base downtown Orlando. That's now Lake Baldwin. And a good friend of mine who was the landscape designer that was brought in for Lake Baldwin. Um, they did this and this is all uh, native plants. This is, uh, I think, Spartina bakeri, sand cordgrass, various trees, uh, blue flag iris, um, probably Sagittaria, uh, duck potato, etc., all along the edge of the lake. This looks so much better. I know you'll hear, well, my little kid got lost in there and we couldn't find him. And this place has snakes and we can't have that. Yeah, there is some getting used to some adjustments we would have to make. And a lot of times our retention ponds are uh, fenced for good reason. But again, think of that migratory bird trying to come down and find for the, for the ducks, find some place to land and then get um, protection from other predators. Oh, there he goes. Forgot about him. <laughs> Landscaping with natives. Here's your typical urban landscape. Uh, of course, this is an older part of Orlando. Houses don't look like that anymore. And we're not saying get rid of all of your grass. Just increase the size of the beds and put a couple of plants and bushes in there. Use your mulch, use the right plant. So this is the same house. Increase the size of the beds. Again, this is just, <laughs> um, the president of our HOA where I live, lived basically across the street from me. And of course, natives had a bad reputation uh, initially, and the way I combated that was I got on the architectural review committee, but he came over after a few years and he says, you know, I think I've noticed uh, something that you're doing. You just keep increasing the size of your beds and reducing the amount of grass. And I'm saying the grass won't grow there. I'm putting a bush in. It makes sense. <laughs> so he caught me out, but he didn't mind it in the end. Here's a backyard with hardscape use. Don't forget hardscape. That's a, a little boardwalk going through there. Hardscape meaning a concrete path, some kind of boardwalk, etc. And I love this photo. Um, every single one of those plants in the bottom photo are native, except maybe that big cactus here, but at least it's drought tolerant. Um, but these are all native ground covers. I think this is mimosa. Um, so you can make it look neat and nice by using the right natives. Use natives as hedges. This is probably a dwarf Walters viburnum or a dwarf Yapon holly with the bigger one behind it. Create a corridor. This is going to be very important too. This was, um, the bottom photo was by one of my master naturalist students who uh, this was her final project was how to create a corridor through her subdivision um, so that your wildlife doesn't have to cross a road or you know a driveway and stuff. So there's ways to connect and make a corridor for your wildlife. And if I'm not boring you too much, that's the problem with these online. I can't tell if you're sleeping or awake, <laughs> if I can't see you. Um, but I'm just going to run through a few plants, if you can still bear with us. Um, porter weed. I hate the use of the word weed. The, actually, the word weed, when we use it on a plant, is an old English term uh, derived from wart, meaning plant. So we call this a porter plant. Anyway, so this is the butterflies. It supports for nectar. Coral honeysuckle supports your hummingbirds and butterflies with, that have a long proboscis. Uh, the fringe tree, for you guys from up north, Grancy gray beard, old man beard it grows I have it in my yard up in Georgia and that's what it looks like up there and this is who 
um, the sphinx caterpillar and moth will larval on this tree and the berries eaten by birds. Firebush, a fabulous plant for anyone's backyard, but do, do please keep in mind to keep it uh, <clears throat> pruned back. But again, hummingbirds, butterflies, the wild coffee is placed with a little bit of extra moisture, but shade. Uh, it will love to thrive. It has nothing to do with coffee. Again, common names are very deceptive. If you look at its Latin term, psychotria, if you eat the berries, you'll go psychotic. Anyway, but great um, pollen for the bees and berries for the birds. Partridge pea, look at all the butterflies, the yellow butterflies. It supports, it's a little bit of a weedy plant. You have to really like it and maybe put it in the backyard. Um, Gulf fritillary, passion vine, and uh, the zebra long wings, the Gulf fritillary, and variegated fritillary. Uh, the caterpillars will stay on that vine. Citrus, again. Um, that's, oh, sorry, it was the giant swallowtail, not the black swallowtail. Uh, that's on citrus. And the black cherry or uh, prunus serotina or any of the cherry prunus trees support the eastern tiger swallowtail. Um, frog fruit, the great little ground cover for slightly more wet areas. Uh, it's the white peacock and the fan crescent uh, will uh, host larval. Rabbit tobacco, cudweed, uh, not the cudweeds coming up now, uh, the American painted lady. And you can't really see, but the caterpillar will be in these little fuzzy tops. And the buckeye, the orange sulfur, toad flax is coming up now. Everybody said, I know, is pull, probably pulling it out as a weed in my yard. Please don't pull it out. It's supporting the buckeye as it migrates north. Um, so do no harm. Don't plant invasives. Please ask the neighbors to remove them. Good luck. I've never had any luck with them. Protect our biodiversity, keep these landscaping principles in mind, and plant for our wildlife. Actually, Jean, that's a very young photo of Mark Gotts, <laughs> if you can recognize him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mark Gotts runs the Green Isle uh, Gardens Native Nursery in Groveland. Okay, we can answer questions. I know I ran through that pretty fast. So, but yeah. Okay, questions? We got one comment that they like looking at the before and after pictures. Those were great. Um, and the, Here's somebody that says they can't wait to go to Green Isle Gardens. And I have a question for you, Jackie. Um, we, uh, Nini saw, there's a video somewhere of someone talking about how it actually is beneficial to plant plants inside of retention ponds. And that's one thing that uh, Nini and I are kind of interested in trying to get the areas around the villages where they have retention ponds. They have a lot of them by these big buildings where they have assisted living. And um, I'd love to get my hands on some information that would prove that mm -hmm. planting stuff in those retention areas is better than leaving them with just grass. And do you know where we could get that kind of data? No, nothing comes to mind. Um, you might try working with the extension office because these nine Florida friendly tips is from the extension office and see what they have. Because all of those little um, 
icons down the side of the different slides came from the from their Florida friendly landscaping brochures. And they talk very much about doing the littoral plantings. Um, your extension office would be the best bet. Okay. Now here's another comment. Somebody says that you should give native plants as housewarming gifts. Um, just make sure you explain to people that you, just because they're <laughs> natives, it doesn't mean you don't have to water them. Um, over the years, this is another comment. Someone says, over the years I've used pine straw, then small pine bark, then more pine straw. As I refresh my pine straw, should I try to dig the pine bark into the soil before refreshing the pine straw? I, I would try and remove the pine bark, but I mean, over time, that pine bark is also going to uh, degrade. So you may not have to do anything. Just make sure, you know, lift it up and see if there's any fungus underneath. Um, and if so, remove it before putting the pine straw down. You can use the pine bark in pathways, you know, where you do need, pine straw is rather slippery to walk on. Um, so use the pine bark in a path instead. All right, and uh, another comment somebody made is uh, that we should mention that we're trying to plan a trip to uh, Oakland Nature Preserve, and you might you were thinking that you might be able to uh, lead us on a guided walk. Did you come up with any dates that would be good, Jackie? Uh, <laughs> you want to do that in the morning? In which case, Thursdays are my better, um, a, a better time frame. Thursdays is my free day. Uh, and I start okay. teaching the Master Naturalist again Wednesdays and Fridays, but afternoons are always available. I will be at Oakland Wednesdays and Fridays starting February 3rd. So after lunch, come on down and we can do a tour. So find out what your folks want the most. Of course, Saturdays are usually available. Um, uh, also, um, Blue Gardens is going to have their annual plant sale this year. And Tarflower will be there with um, all the plants from uh, Green Isles. And that'll be March 13th and 14th. No, oh, and that's a wonderful no. event. Yeah, I don't know how they're going to manage that. You know, how are they going to keep us distancing or if they're even going to, I don't know what the lo pandemic logistics are uh, on that. You'll have to research it uh, on their website. I just know we're going to be there. <laughs> okay, a yeah, great place to go get some natives and see a huge variety of them too. Um, here's a uh, Nini suggested that perhaps you talk about the um, Master Naturalist program. I know Nini and I just went through that program and we really loved it. And you did an awesome job hosting that. And um, so maybe you could tell everybody a little bit more about that. Um, the best way is to go on the website for Florida Master Naturalist program. And it gives a very nice overview, but basically it's for Anybody who wants to know more about Florida, I mean, you saw some of the biodiversity on my slides. You saw some, you know, and learned about hydrology and Lake Wales Ridge. All of that is covered in three basic courses, uh, uplands, wetlands, and coastal. The coastal is fascinating. And now that they're being offered online, anybody sitting anywhere in Florida can take it uh, you don't have to travel. Uh, in the past, when it was face-to-face, -face, you had to come to me at the Oakland Nature Preserve and, and do a field hike and then classroom work. Um, so it's now available more extensively. Uh, you are probably required to, like if you're taking the coastal, you got to get to a beach at some point <laughs> and go look at a sand dune. Um, but uh, 
there are many other courses now coming online. They have habitat evaluation, conservation science, interpretation, uh, coastal restoration, and marine restoration. And as I mentioned, the invasive plant is a brand new one that has come on board. And you get this very, very nice, um, very nice plaque if you take all seven and then you get the designation as land manager. Uh, if you take the three basic ones, you can be a master naturalist. Um, and they're fun. And if you don't know anything about Florida, it's a great way to learn. And by the same token, if you're a park ranger or I've actually, you know, who has to take nature hikes, it'll help you speak more intelligently about what's going on in, in your state park. But I've also had students who like work for the telephone company because they have to do wetland. They have to figure out where the wetland is and where can I stick my great big telephone pole? And what am I destroying when I run all of these high tension wires someplace? Uh, so it's a certification for certain people like for nature preserves or park rangers. Um, it is, it's not CEUs, although I think for teachers who take it, we, they do um, give you a, a credit uh, for that. And, but basically it's for anybody new to Florida who just wants to learn more. Um, about its ecology, hydrology, the mammals, where they live, how they live, etc. Now, yes, it's given through the University of Florida IFAS. Um, it is not for college credit, and you get out of it what you put into it, and uh, you don't have to know anything to to jump in there and learn. We the types of students I get range from they could teach the class better than me <laughs> to the brand new novice just down from Florida who doesn't know they're walking on fish poop. Uh, so, uh, but it's Florida Master Naturalist, fmnp.org on the web. And um, look at the various classes and then look at who's offering which class where and if it fits your schedule. Most, they're all online now. Uh, some of them are hybrid where I will do two field trips for the upcoming class, um, two face-to-face -face field trips, um, limited in number. And if I get too many, I'll just bring on another instructor and we'll go off in a different direction. Um, but uh, a lot of them are strictly online. So take your pick, jump in. Okay. I have one more question. Okay. Uh, I, 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 this says, I am trying to change my garden from builder special landscaping to <laughs> native plants. <laughs> Do I need to bring in topsoil to give plants a boost? No, get down to the original soil of sand that's underneath all of that junk they put on your yard. No, don't worry about it. You don't need anything. Florida plants want sand. Well, for the high, dry, sunny spots. Again, and Jean should be able to show you from the class how you can go onto the soil map and figure out what your soil was before they dumped that house on there. Um, for the most part, I think the villagers are mostly either pine flatwoods or sand hill. So it's either going to be slightly darker soil underneath that has a little more compost duff in it to pure white sand. But most of um, the native plants, wildflowers, trees, etc., you don't need anything extra. Very good. All right, so I think that about does it for our questions. I don't okay, see, oh, wait a minute, here's one more. Let me see someone, there's one more. Uh, it says, my okay. village built on a dairy farm. I have lots of clay. Yeah, th there is a lot of clay in this uh, area. 
not naturally. They brought it in. Oh, really? I'm pretty I'm sure sitting in, because. But I'm sitting on a lot of clay in mine, and I don't think any soil was brought onto my, my. Check, check the soil map, like, um, check the soil map. You can just, it's USDA soil map and give the address and it'll tell you what that was prior to being built. Right. And it is a fabulous uh, resource, that soil thing on IFAS. Yeah. In fact, I think there's even an app. Didn't Laura give us um, an app for your iPhone and you can just stand there with your phone and it'll tell you what the soil was before they built on it. So I, right. I haven't used the app, um, but it, just go on the computer and download the, the soil map for and it's pretty easy to navigate through. It's pretty self-explanatory. And you can see what your house was. And I'm, if you've got a lot of clay, odds are you were somewhere in a pine flatwoods or approaching a wetland that they covered over. Because the wetland is created when the water can't percolate because of a confining layer and clay is usually that confining or karst is that confining layer where the water can't percolate. So I know a lot of wetlands, if you remember, uh, well, if you took the wetlands class, over 50% of the wetlands in Florida have been destroyed for houses. So um, yeah. it, it may have been pretty close to a wetland or a pine flatwoods, which would have had a little more clay in the soil, but I know out at Oakland, Nature Preserve, when they built that uh, parking lot and driveway, I can go 10, 20 feet out from the um, parking lot and I'm still finding clay that they brought in to build the road with. I put in the wow. chat the uh, link to that soil map. Thank you, thank you. I think that's very important for people to know what it was before. And then generally I know when they build houses, they'll bring in muck or some other improved soil so the St. Augustine grass will grow <laughs> but down dig down three four feet you should find what it was previously and remember that's what we had to do in the class you had to go dig a hole <laughs> and see what was the color of the soil prior okay you want me to stop sharing <laughs> Okay, well, Jackie, thank you. That was just a wonderful presentation. I, I, we really enjoyed it. And uh, again, uh, if any of you are interested in the Master Naturals program, she teaches it and it's a wonderful class. Um, thank you so much. Um, Sue, did you wanna say anything? I'm gonna hand it off to you. <laughs> She'll be I just wanna thank, thank Jackie for such an interesting presentation today. I learned a lot. I hope everybody else did. Um, just want to put a plug, please, by all means, if you want to get more involved, you, you will learn lots of information if you join our, uh, the society and you join by going to the state website, it's fmps.org. Um, and that's how you join. We do have a website and maybe somebody else can I don't know the, um, the um, address of it. Uh, we have a personal website that we do put up stuff about our, our chapter. And I'd love to see you guys at the next meeting. Thank well, you. Um, thank you. And uh, thank you for stepping up, Sue, and everyone else that's um, going to be helping out this year. And again, um, <clears throat> I've enjoyed um, and we'll continue on with the programs and um, we hope to see everyone next month. Uh, it will be online next month. I guess we'll be telling people kind of monthly how the um, situation develops and when we'll meet in person. But thanks everyone and um, we'll see you soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and thank you Jackie, thank you. so much. You're welcome, my pleasure, thanks. Thank you, Nini, for all your efforts. Oh. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everyone.